everybody. Welcome to episode 62 of the Wildlife Photography Q&A. Now, usually in the past what we do is we'll ask you guys to send through questions re relating to wildlife, photography and travel. And then Jerry and myself will either co-host together or one of us will host a episode by ourselves. For this particular episode, we decided to, to narrow it down a little bit because of sort of previous um, discussions we've had with other people in the industry between ourselves. And I think it's a discussion that we've been wanting to have for a very, very long time. So yesterday, we asked you guys to send through some questions. I think we're going to, uh, you got a few questions, I got a few questions. But then we might just um, elaborate on it a little bit and just see what mm. sort of um, maybe upsets us or maybe what we feel <laughs> is, um, is, is not <laughs> being done in the right way. What upsets moment. us? How much time do you have? Yeah. Brace yourself for about four hours. Yeah, four hours. <laughs> four hours going out. So, I mean, I think, and like Johan says, this is, so this is the Q&A for tomorrow. We're releasing this, this on Thursday, not Friday, because it's a long weekend. But I think with what we've been doing, with having been in the industry for so long, wildlife photography and guiding, and seeing what happens out there, and hearing what happens out there, and getting the questions you guys ask, there's some bad shit going on. Yeah. And the one problem with something like Instagram, with these platforms, is everybody has a, a little tomorrow box to stand on. Yeah. And if someone has a lot of followers, it automatically means that they know what they're doing and they're doing the right thing, yeah. which is not right. Yeah. So a lot of the questions here, it will, we'll go through. We are live streaming this on two devices as well. So for those of you listening on the live stream, if you have any questions, we'll pull those in as well. But um, I think the easiest way to start this, we're just gonna do one take right through, right? Yeah. So Marie Astor on my feed asked, and this kind of kicks us off, I think, is she's been in a couple of conversations with wildlife photographers. Mm -hmm. And in those conversations, it's often said that most wildlife photographers bait their animals or bait their subjects. And there was a lot of people that was arguing for that. And she says, is this true? What do you think? No. Uh, and I think it would be quite easy and quite interesting if we had to sort of you know, list your five absolute no-goes. Because, and this is a, like another conversation that we've been having quite a bit is, that there, there needs to be a, a sort of a line or a, a place where conservation and tourism meet. Mm -hmm. And wildlife photography is part of that um, that tourism bracket, right? So th there's a certain line where that has to meet. And for me, the, the feeding is the obvious, like, no-go. I mean, I don't care if, if it's from a, from a bird to a squirrel to a, whatever it might be, a <coughs> fox, an elephant, a lion, you just don't do it. It, it just shouldn't be mm. anywhere close to... Yeah. Um, anywhere close to wildlife photography. I think if you're going to do it, if you yeah. if you open up your little um, duck pond in Bumpsfontein and you're going to build a hide there, mm. and, you know, be honest about it then. Say, yeah. listen, okay, guys, you know, I've got this fish eagle here. You can come and photograph it, but we feed it a live bass or dead bass every single day. And sure. You'll get your images. Yeah. But I, know, I know what a lot of people will say then. I mean, if, before we dig into these and the feeding thing, obviously we're talking wildlife photography. Mm. So we're saying in a wildlife reserve, do not feed the animals. Now, at what, where do you draw the line? But what about a bird? Yeah. You've got a bird feeder. So I've got bird feeders in my home. Yes. You, you probably have as yeah. well. But think about this. They there whether I'm feeding them or not. Yeah. These things are not as natural. No, exactly. They're not living in the bush out in the middle of fucking Salu Game Reserve, yeah. and you've got a feeding station up there. Lodges do still have it. Yes, but the birds can leave, and at home, especially here, I mean, I often I'll have my things out. I've got like it's it's a beautiful bird station. By yeah, way, for those of you asking. <laughs> so, but these things will be feeding off the seed that I put out. Yet they fly two meters and they feed off the tree. Yeah. So, because the birds have basically almost infiltrated our normal life in the cities, I mean, with Johannesburg being one of the biggest forested cities in the world, yeah. they're there already. So, we need to try and just, to, there's, there's a little gray area when it comes to the birding side of it. Yeah. But let's not bait lions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and this is going to be sort of almost sort of contradictive what, what I just said, but, you know, there, there are scenarios, and I think this is again where it becomes it gets communicated clearly is if you have like a, a wild dog pack right that yes. gets moved from reserve to reserve so you know reserves in south africa i'm speaking now well actually like all reserves whether you, you like it or not it's a business yeah right? if, they, if they don't have money if they don't have people coming into the doors the, those reserves will close so a reserve in south africa as soon as you put a fence around it it has to be managed as a business and what they'll do you know one, one particular reserve for example might have 
20 wild dog puppies um, born all of a sudden they're sitting with a pack of 30 dogs they have to sort of maybe try and sell some of them mm. wild dogs are in relatively sort of high demand if you have a big enough reserve they then have to stay in what we call a boma so it's a very small fenced off area mm. uh, for them just to get used to the smells and for some of the drugs to wear off because a lot of them have to be drugged for the uh, transportation and then during this period they will have to that you obviously can't go and put a um, a live impala or whatever in the in the boma so yeah. they will then have to feed them in order to sustain them interesting point actually but you know that's but that's feeding for the conservation side of it it's not feeding to get your wildlife photographs i think that's where yeah. it's a part of the it's a part of the introduction system in order to keep the the animal safe and fed while he's being introduced yes. into this new thing so that's that's where the gray area comes in again and the same would happen with lions i mean when i was in Madikwe at the same time as you we did a lot of conservation work and we would move lions yeah. so you would dot them they'd go to the boma because they have to check for disease and and and, and. Mm. so you can't expect this lion not to eat for five days mm. so they would feed him but it's not for tourism yeah it's the process of creating conservation systems which will then support tourism yeah so that, that, that's not feeding the animal, that's conservation, getting them through the process. And you're not lining photographers up to do that. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, and I, I love where this is going because this is like a similar thing I wanted to do um, in, in the coming weeks. But a lot of people will then say, you know, leave the animals, they'll sort themselves out. But again, like I said, <laughs> if, if you go to places like the Masai Mara and the, and the Serengeti and the South of Anguas and those parts that <coughs> don't have fences around, yes, the animals do sort themselves out. Unfortunately, what's happened in South Africa is we've we've messed things up as humans. We, we've become, you know, I mean, we had we had the, the, we had the greatest um, or the, the biggest migration of animals, bigger than the Great Migration in South Africa in, in the Free State. Yeah, between the Free State and the Karoo, we, we had massive migrations of springbok and wildebeest and things. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, humans again, we put fences up for for farming. We we shut. We pretty much like smashed everything out. One hundred percent. So it, it is our fault, but it's also our responsibility now to put those reserves back in place. And it, it's, it's not just the conservation of the animals, but it's also think of the, the people it, it employs. Mm. Um, you know, th- that, that guy who used to be a farmer now works at a lodge, he might, might become a guide. He then has a kid. That's our future generation of conservationists. Mm. So it has to be seen as, you know, think a little bit further than, you know, just the... Um, you know, humans can't get involved at all because humans were the, I think, were the cause in the first place. So I think, 100%. and we, we're speaking of South Africa here now, yes, in particular, because yeah. it has become to develop. There are a lot of communities around these reserves, but I think in order for conservation to really become successful, those local communities mm. need to benefit 100 from from the park. I think I think if you look at the Madikwe model, mm. so we both spend an extensive amount of time on Madikwe. We still run safaris there. And whenever people ask, what's the history? So, correct me if I'm wrong, it must be about 20, 22 years or something now. Um, but Madikwe was created for a combination of farmlands, <coughs> local communities, and government. Yes. And Operation Phoenix was the, was the process of restocking the area. And what we used to say is, the animals that were brought in are the ones that always used to occur there naturally. But like you said, yes. we messed it up because farms got put up and this and that the other so that is what we're trying to do in south africa obviously the model in, in east africa is different there's no yeah. fences and some of the questions lead to that but but yeah it's a you you have to and let's not go there now but the hunting and bunny hugger side of it mm. so yes they can work together yes but we need to be able to give and take a little bit we need to be able to say it okay is, cool 100 yeah. percent, because it is so polarized it is so polarized that people jump on a bandwagon and off it goes and from both sides yeah but i i think you know where where this comes from um most of all is i think like you said on instagram people often see stuff that you can see is clearly unethical you know um i'm not going to go there yet it might might come out later (laughs) but um you know using using people to enhance your, your photos and whatever it may be and people think it's amazing and then at the same time, people have, will have something that's totally um, harmless, almost like a lion walking past your vehicle, and they'll say, mm. you know, you, you're interfering with the animal. So I think we also just want to yeah. try and, you know, try and guide people in, in the right direction of 
what is acceptable and sure. you know what is like totally a no go. A, a couple of things. The first thought, which I'm going to just pause for now, but this one here, the one question is thoughts on the freaking demand for wildlife selfies. Now I'm not sure demand is the right word, but quick story. So many years ago, I was in Sabi Sands workshop, I think. Mm. So, I remember like six, seven years ago. And Instagram wasn't a thing yet. Facebook was a thing. And I basically, we've got a family group, WhatsApp, don't we all? And I went, at once we were sitting down, my guest in front, and the elephant to my side, I take a selfie. Mm-hmm. Elephant didn't give a shit. He's right over there. No. Then I do a rhino and a buffalo. And on the family group, they said, I bet you can't get big five selfies. Yeah. I'm like, screw you. <laughs> so I can do that. So on the one day, so I'll be sad to known for leopards. So I'm sitting at the back because my guests are in front. And this leopard walks past the vehicle and underneath and away. So I lean over and I get like a selfie over with this leopard's ass going away from me. Yeah. All good. So then I haven't posted any of this online. I literally just, it's for the family group. So then I have to get lions. So on the last morning of this trip, there's two male lions walking down the road towards us. We pull off to the side, our vehicle facing them. And I know they're going to walk here because the one's gone already. The other one's passing. You know he's going to walk there. So I basically turn my half my back to, to the road, we're off-road, and I'm waiting to take my selfie down like this. So I'm waiting. I mean, he's not a, he's like three meters away. Yeah. And as I can now see my selfie happening, this lion almost like looks up at it like, oh, nice. <laughs> so I take this picture and I'm like, send to the family group. I'm like, yeah, I did this. That afternoon I get home, finished. I post it on my Facebook page at the time, right? And um, I posted the final lion image with this lion looking up at me and I post it I come back like two hours later and there is a message about this long right from the guy's name was Adam from America and I start reading and he starts telling me how pathetic a human I am because why do I do this to wildlife and 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 so I read half of this and I think you know what I was still trying to be nice at that time not saying what I think I let me just write back and I just say, hi Adam, thanks for your comment, do you know what I do? And he writes back and he says, oh sorry, I thought you were hunting. So the connotation from people who haven't been here, they think yeah. that if, I'm, if, if an animal is close enough to take a selfie with, it's bad. That lion didn't give a shit. Yeah. Probably if I sat down looking at him, it probably would have been more stressful because then there's eye contact. Yeah. But people jump on this bandwagon. So I don't think, who's this, Riley95, yeah. I don't think it's a demand for wildlife selfies. But in today's world, it's going to happen. Yeah. How many wildlife selfies have you taken? No, quite a few. Loads, of course. Because I want to be able to go back and say, hey, check this moment yeah. to my family, to my friends, and say to you guys, hey, look, if you come with me, I've got a polar bear selfie. Look, it's this big, yeah. but still. So I think the demand, therefore, is not a problem. I think it's actually a good thing because in the long run, that'll get people to safari. It's how it's done in the field. Exactly. So, And I, I think also, you know, try and... Um, Sorry, just, I mean, difficulties. <laughs> um, Tech issues. You also have to, you know, look at the animal's behavior. You know, if you've, if you've got um, an elephant cow, you know, young elephant bulls, they, they're a little bit different because they like teenage mm. boys, you know, they're just fighting themselves. They literally sometimes, you'll get individuals that will just run at absolutely anything. Mm. But if you get a lion sort of snarling at you and, you know, his eyes are this big and his tail's up and his ears are flat, He's not a happy cat, right? And the same way with, with any of the animals. I think you also have to be within the boundaries of what you're allowed to do. You know, if you're now sitting with a pride of lions and you stepping out of the vehicle just to get a selfie going, you know, then that's where the issue starts coming in. If you're in a vehicle and you, you, you're in the, the safety of that vehicle, then then it's fine. You know, and like I said, you know, the, I know there have been photos of like models and things being used for um, for some images, you know, whether it be with elephants or whatever it may be, but just, you know, just be aware of the repercussions that you could be that could happen. Mm. Um, you know, you could, sorry, you could, um, you know, what if that elephant or lion turns, and then all of a sudden, you know, that person that you use as a model now gets killed by that animal? How are you, as a person, going to explain to that family? That listen, your son or your daughter, whatever, has been killed because you know I wanted to get an amazing shot, and I think that that's mm. that's for me the way it, it's it's really hit home. I mean, we've we've we know people that have been yeah. um, that have been accidents that have been killed by 
um, by lions, um, by by elephants, you know, and it happens. It happens, and you you just got to be so careful. You don't want to put yourself out there. I think. I think the whole thing with putting people in images. So a selfie of me taking a picture. I mean, G saying here, she's also guilty as charged. She's taken a picture with Scarface, but he was flat out sleeping for three hours. Yeah. Why is that a bad thing? Yeah. Of course you should take that selfie. When you put people in the shot and you are standing back as the photographer, the my problem is then they start calling it wildlife photography. Mm. It is not wildlife photography yeah. anymore. No, exactly. We need to look at this on a continuum, right? Yeah. So for me, something like putting a person in an image, right, is going over. Then you're starting to create people's stories, right? So something like, I'm trying to think now. I've seen in the Kruger National Park the following. I had a trip in Sabi Sabi, and I had to go pick someone up on the other side. So I drove through the Kruger. Mm. That there was a leopard behind a bush. Okay, and then in the Kruger, there's 50 vehicles. Yeah. There's one guy in a white single cab Hilux Bucky. Two guys. You can see they had a couple to drink. Mm-hmm. They literally edged closer. The bush is next to the road. The lip is behind this. Yeah. They nudged into it with their car, pushed it, and this thing ran away. They just pushed the car, right. and the thing ran away. Then I was also in Madikwe once. And I know which lodge this is, because I was running a photo safari from a wildlife point of view. And I think it was Bravo 1. Yeah. So there's lions sleeping. I'm talking photography to the people. We're going to do this. We're going to shoot this, that, the other. The people on the vehicle and the guy didn't say a word, took ice out of the cooler box and threw it at the lions. And I heard them say, because then nobody will know we threw anything. So so on the continuum, that's fucked up. That's wrong. That should not even happen. You shouldn't even think of that. Then there's people who say, okay, but cool. I know I was with rangers. Therefore, I put a model in the shot and that's okay. That's wildlife photography. There are gray areas here, yeah. but common sense, guys. And, and also, you know, talking about the, 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 the repercussions, you're also putting that guide's job in, in, in danger. You know, if, if, if that person ends up getting killed by an elephant or rhino or lion or whatever it might be, mm. that guy's the serious shit. Yeah. Or if you, if the guide is forced to shoot the animal because of something you did, yeah. he gets suspended immediately. Not fair. In, no. With immediate effect, he's suspended. I think the biggest thing, and someone said it here now, is let's define this. What is the the duty, the job, the privilege of a wildlife photographer? It is to go and photograph animals in their natural environment, Mm -hmm. doing what they are doing naturally, whether we are there or not, and to leave them without having changed behavior. Yes. If those things check out, it's real wildlife photography. Yes. You put food in there, you put people in there, you throw ice, you bump a tree, you shout, you clap your hands, you scream, anything. Mm. You've crossed the line. Yeah. But it's also, you know, and, and I know it's going to come up because it, it always does when you have, you know, we're talking about the, the, the tree huggers to the hunters and things, and when it comes together, <clears throat> people will say, you know, but you're interrupting them anyway. Yes, of course. And the, I mean, the, the minute you, you put a road in there, the minute you put a lodge in there, the minute you drive a fence, vehicle in yeah. there, a fence, you're interrupting it, but there has to be a line where it meets. You know, what is acceptable? If a lion is sleeping and you park your vehicle there and he lifts his head up and looks at you and lies down again, that is acceptable. Yes, it's changed a little bit, but it's mm. it's as little impact as you can possibly have. Yeah. Driving a leopard through a bush when it's trying to get away from you. Dick move. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, in, you know, it's, it's quite interesting also how it works from reserve to reserve because... I think from a, a wildlife viewing point of view, obviously the wildlife, their well-being has to be first, mm. but yet you want to maximize people's viewing yeah. so that they can then spend money to come back again. Right? Money brings in the business to keep mm. all these lodges going. So yeah. it, it takes something, for example, like wild dogs. Mm. And I, I've had many different um, reserves, have many different... Um, sort of codes of conduct almost when it comes to this. So you have a wild dog pack that is denning. Mm. Uh, I know mono pools, yeah. they often say that's off limits, you can't go to the den Den site closed. At all, that's mm. closed. And, and maybe it's because of the, the majority of it is walking, so there's a lot more of human scent that could be around there. Um, in Medikwe, I remember they used to put um, a one vehicle at a time, mm-hmm. And they were also clever. Craig would also put a camera up there. So if you screw up anything, you don't you don't see that camera, but there'll be a camera trap in there somewhere, 
where you will then know, listen, yeah. if you do something wrong, if you go too close to the, the yeah. den, or if you do something stupid, there will be camera footage of you of you doing it. Then there are other reserves as well that also do uh, maybe two or three vehicles at a time. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's again, you know, and like, look, if there's any of you in the guiding industry that want to jump on, then please, yeah. please let us know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've got, a, I've got a thing here from um, Riandi Apple. The little bit of impact you are talking about now, responsibly done at the end of the day, brings in the money needed for continuing conservation. 100%. That's it. Think about it in South African terms. So like Johan said, we have fences around our reserves because yeah. of many reasons. I tell you now, if we, those fences were not up, there would be no lions, yeah. no leopards, no nothing. No. Because people would have taken over. So those fences protect the animals, but still, we have to then manage it ethically inside. Exactly. That's a big thing. Exactly. The concern for me, look, I've never had this because I'm crass enough to tell someone to piss off, but mm. in East Africa, right, you have to park a certain distance away from the Mara River. Yeah. Before you can go in. Yes. How often do those guys not, and you see them, I've seen it happen, where the guy will say, like, you know what, um, Yana, that's cool, I'm not allowed to go closer, and then the guest says, well, this hundred dollars says you will. Yes. And in they go, and because they take the cash. But I, I think that that's what it comes to, down to, to training as well. Yeah. And I spoke to you last week with Scott and Candice over, yes. you were there as well. They um, they run Ulevani mm-hmm. Environmental Training, and I think that that's one of the biggest things that's not being taught to guides. Um, and look, I mean, also this, on the same note, I'm not saying by any means that I, I've been an angel my whole guiding career. Most of these mistakes that we're talking about now, I've made. A um, lot of the times without clients. That's um, an episode on its own. That's an episode on its own. But, you know, I'm not by, and I'm sure you'll agree, not saying I'm, we are angels by any means, but, you know, as, as a young guide, you have to kind of push the boundaries often by yourself or with other guides mm. in order to know how you will react when you're faced with a particular scenario when you're with clients. Mm. With, with, with clients, obviously, it's a, it's a bit of a different thing, but I think it, it's something that needs to be taught more to young guides. That, and you have to have the, the, the backup and the yeah. 100% support from your, your lodge owner or your head guide or general manager, whoever it may be, that if you've got that person that says to you, you know what, you will go off-road for this particular leopard with a cub, or I will complain, whatever, that you can sort of s- go for it. S- say, s- say to the, um, the guest or whoever it might be, I don't care if it's Brad Pitt or whoever, say, this is not what we're doing, we're going we're gonna to turn around and, mm. you know, if you're not happy, then you know, go book somewhere else. But I think that the case is, in East Africa, it's often mm. the lack of guide training yes. and also the, the fear of potentially, you know, getting a complaint and also the money factor. Yeah. 100%. I think just to, just to go back a step, you, you mentioned we aren't angels. Now think about this. I mean, I've been, how long have you been guiding? I've been in for like 15, 16 years or so. Yeah. Long time. 2006, yeah. So, <laughs> yes, we did wrong things when we were younger. 100%. I think if we back it, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I did it, so did you. Yeah. So did pretty much any guy. But in those days, two things didn't happen. Number one, I don't think the education was up to what it was. Yeah. The, the, the guiding education was cool, but the human and conservation system that we need to protect wasn't as drilled into us at that time. Mm. We learned that, we, we were fixing the plane while it's flying. Yeah. So we were doing that. Also, and I think in today's world, with all the information available, with social media, it is now the guide's responsibility, whether they like it or not, mm. to be ethical. I promise you, if I did some of the stuff when I was younger and never with clients, with guides, yeah. And it went on to social, right. fucked. Screwed. But, the guiding license is gone. But I didn't think like that. Mm. Now I do. It's And don't blame me for this. You would have done it as well. Yeah. But now I know what's right and wrong. But a guy starting today, he posts one of those things on an Instagram. No. He's done. Or if a guest posts it. Yeah. And I think if, if guys can start thinking of, you know what, let me use the visibility that I have for good. Yes, 100%. Then we're getting somewhere. Don't bullshit. Don't put a person in front of an elephant and say it's wildlife photography. No. No. Yeah. It's not right. No. It's not right. And, you know, I think probably like 95% of the time, if, yeah, you, if, if you explain to people why you're not comfortable doing that, you know, at the end of the day, as a guide, <coughs> you are responsible for the lives of those people. You know, yeah. whether it be um, us with our guests, even with the local guide, even with the local guide, I still feel that the guests are my responsibility from a safety point of view. Yeah. And... 
I think that's, and we'll come to, you know, working with, with local guides as well. But I think if you explain yourself why you're not comfortable in approaching a, a certain sighting or, you know, why it is having a negative effect, it, it, you know, it all comes down to education. If you can educate people properly why you're not doing something in particular, I think people will understand. Yep. Um, it's just being honest yeah. and open. Just, sorry, on this, um, Judy says, I experienced this on San Saturday with the t- um, Tonabora brothers, those five cheetah. Mm-hmm. There were 15 vehicles as I was following these poor cheetah and hindered their topic kill, was upset, had to tell our guy to please leave. It's because, again, the lack of education, yeah. the, the, the lack of confidence and support from that guy to say to the guest, listen, guys, this... What's happening here? Us stopping right. these cats from hunting is not right. Let's leave. Mm. Then some guests will say, yeah, but what, what about the other people staying? Mm. Well, that's where the problem comes in. It's, it's, it's the, the one step to a big journey type yeah. thing. Make the change. Yeah. And it's, it's what you say. It's education. It's the lack of backup and money. Yeah. And, money. And I think that that's, you know, for as a private guide, you know, for us going to these lodges, it can often be an intimidating thing. You know, I remember when I used to guide, um, I was always too scared to guide Jay. I never had the privilege of doing that because I wouldn't be able to focus. <laughs> yes. But uh, and, uh, I've, I've guided a few photographic guides and it's, it, it is often a very intimidating thing, right? Because, you know, how much do you say the, these clients are now paying him to come on safari with him or her? But I think as that private guide, you know, you, you need to have the balls to go to your, your local guide and say to him, listen, we don't have to rush around every corner and photograph every single yeah. leopard in the first 12 hours. We don't need to be two meters away from a leopard. You know, we, we don't need to crash through the bush to get a glimpse of a leopard. You know, these kind of things you have to say before and, and, and to, to say to the guy, listen, if I say to you, we don't have to do it. Don't take it personally. Mm-hmm. Just take it from the experiences that we probably had and also probably knowing our clients. You know, some of our clients don't want to sort of go off-road and go bunda bashing and mm. also run the risk of potentially getting injured, you know, hitting your face in the vehicle. You yeah. never know. You hit one big hole and... Um, I've seen people fall out of vehicles. Mm. People driving in front of an off-road boom and then falls, falls out. Okay, let's get to one of the questions. Um, okay, that's not a question. Some countries forbid night safari, so I'm just wondering how to respect when it is permitted. Mm. Ethical guides. I love what you guys are saying on the live. We'll get to you guys. So just for those of you that don't know, in Southern Africa and in one or two Southern African reserves, you can do night drives, i.e. you stay out after dark, you use a spotlight to look for and find and photograph animals. Not all, but we'll get to that now. In East Africa, it's an unusual thing. In the private conservancies, yes. Main reserves, not always. So what do we have to keep in mind? Hmm. Can I tell you my honest, honest yes. feeling with this? If I had my way, I would say no night drives. Anyway, um, and, and I, I know that sounds harsh, but for me, it just, as soon as you say to people, use your own discretion, it, it kind of goes, you know, out, out the window. You know, yeah. people don't have discretion. Yeah. Um, I understand, you know, if you're doing night drives, you often, well, if you don't do night drives, you, you lose out on the opportunity to view some of the nocturnal animals. Um, you know, spotting chameleons or bush babies or yeah. you know, aardvark or pangolin, all these things. I get that. But I personally do feel that it causes more harm than good. You know, like uh, ph- photographically, you can, you can get some cool stuff done. Uh, backlit, um, side lighting stuff. But uh, yeah. my feeling is it's, it's more like watching women's tennis. Your head just goes from left to right and yeah. watching the spotlight. <laughs> so I think, yeah, so Brad says no lights on nocturnal animals, period. Judy says it's not allowed in the Mara in most places, and I'm happy it isn't for sure. Yeah. So I mean, just so so from a from a an anatomical point of view, if you will. So nocturnal animals have something called the tapetum lucidum. If you look at a tennis ball and you chop it in half, the inside of the eyeball there's a reflective layer of cells which protects the fovea, which is where the nerve endings from the brain goes into the eyeball, and that's what carries the, the signal through. So it's always been said mm. that the, the tapetum lucidum will protect the fovea, which is the nerve damage. Whereas diurnal animals like your giraffe and those kind of things don't have it. No. Still, I've seen and you've seen, and I'm sure you guys that have been on safari, if you have a lion that's sitting up looking around, that flashlight comes onto me, he does blink and pull mm. back. He might recover a bit sooner, but there's still that moment. Yeah. There's stories, some of the very famous game reserves in South Africa in the past 
on their airstrip, this is in the late 80s, mm-hmm. they would find lions hunting on the airstrip and they would purposefully put a spotlight on the prey species that can now see shit so that they can see a hunt. Yep. This is what used to happen. Yep. So it does affect the animals. Yep. And it's not going to stop. But And then we say things like, okay, cool, let's bounce the light off the floor. Mm. That's fine. I mean, is it easier? Go and put one of those spotlights on you. See what yeah. you feel like. Even worse, then you get some photographic companies who, who specialize in flash photography. Yeah. I was about to say, that, 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 for me, shit. that for me is even worse. So you, you get these videos on Instagram where this leopard's walking down the road. It looks like he's in a fucking disco. Yeah. There's just like flashes everywhere. I mean, if you're at a party and someone takes a picture of the flash, you're like this. Now, imagine yeah. that strobe again and again and again. Mm. How is that right? And I think if, if, if anything, you know, if you're going to defend spotlights, at least it's a consistent light. So the eyes do kind of adapt to it. If you take a flash, you know, it goes from completely dark to all of a sudden, boom, there yeah. it is. And then it's dark and then boom, there it is. Mm-hmm. Is it boom, there it is. Boom, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, a flash photography for me is, is again, it's a no-go. And I, I think, again, you know, it's, it's about how you explain it to your clients. I had Sandeep now, we're going to Botswana hopefully yes. next week, and he asked me about flashes, and I explained it to him. And I mean, he didn't even second or question it one bit. He was like, okay, cool, that's fine. Mm. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's all about explaining it and just, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's what's, what's best for the animals. Mm. Um, let's change track here for a moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Legend Safaris asks, thoughts on guides entering competitions where their pictures while hosting guests. So we kind of step away from ethics from an animal point of view. Mm-hmm. Now we're talking ethics from a business point of view. Thoughts? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, we've, we've had this um, agreement with us that we, we're not going to do it because I think, firstly, you know, put yourself in the situation of the client, right? They're paying you now to go on safari with mm-hmm. them. So they're paying for your flight, your accommodation, your vehicle, your food, drinks, all of that. Now you go on safari with them where you're supposed to be teaching them about photography. Mm-hmm. You dial in, hopefully, if you're a good guide, kind of the same settings that you guide in with, let's say the same lens, mm. you both take the same image. Now you take your image and you send it into five different people for uh, competitions and things. Your client doesn't even know about half of these competitions going on, which you know, if they were, you should have introduced him or her mm-hmm. to it. And you now win a competition for something that you didn't even, that you got paid to go on. Mm. For me, that doesn't sit, no. doesn't sit well. I think it's a hundred percent no go. Hundred no. percent. I mean, I don't. I do do competitions for the best of time. I recommend my clients do because there's a certain creative and growth process from it. Mm. Don't give a shit about the results because that doesn't matter. Yeah. Competition. I mean, competing at photography is like competing at yoga. Yeah. Ain't gonna work. Yeah. But again, like you say, if someone pays me for the services, it's my job to make them create images that's competition worthy. Yeah. My best moment, and in. The last competition I entered was like in 2009 or something, mm. way before Wild Eye. But David Rosenzweig, one of my clients, he's did, at this time he did about three or four trips with me. And the one day I get a WhatsApp from him and he says, hey, check this out. And it's a video clip. He won not the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, Nature's Best. Oh, yeah. Big competition. He won the Junior Award. And he sent me a video clip of him standing on stage accepting his reward. And he said in the speech, I would like to thank Jerry from Wildlife for making this possible. That's amazing. To me, that's it. Yeah. And I believe, and I won't back on this, if you're a photographic guide and that doesn't mean more to you than your own images winning shit, get out of the industry. Yeah. Then pay for your own trips, go and do your own photographs, don't fuck your guests around by charging their money and then you getting the fame of it. Yeah, 100%. I think the, the, the only time possibly that I'll take an image like before my guests is to show them back of camera Kind of from a composition point of view, what you're looking at, you know, if it if it's a stationary sighting, it was li- lions on a rock or something. I'll take a photograph and just show them more or less the yeah. the um, composition that you yeah. know, might work for that particular frame. But and I think that, that that's where you know people often ask to join um, <laughs> to join our like um, private guiding or join our team here, and it's and one of the first things that I remember you always say it as well is people will send through their five favorite images, mm. and it's. The amount of times that you will miss images out in the field if you're teaching the right way is a shitload. I could we could probably oh. fill up a whole um, a whole uh, what's that thing called? A hard drive. After lunch, a, a whole hard drive 
with uh, with images that I've missed because yeah. your focus should be on your clients. You know, I think that's where that's where so many of the guys are getting it wrong. You can see who's yeah. doing it right and who's doing it wrong. I mean, it's very obvious from um, from images and things. And here's another thing. So you're on a safari with clients. Mm. You know, posting while you're out in the field before your clients post that. No, not necessarily. No. So, uh, you, 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 no. even that for me is like a, like a big thing, you know, like I don't, that's why I've gone sort of on a trip, I hardly ever like edit images anymore. I'll download, mm. it stays on there and I'll sort it out once I get yeah. home. I think, I mean, and what you think, just for those of you that might not understand, just Brad, I'm super impressed. Brad remembers Photo Africa days. Oh, wow. Which was my company before Wild Eye. Yes. Brad, you are a rock star. <laughs> so, what I mean is, so you go out on Safari and then people will, um, they, they, you all get the same images because you're in the same sightings. As soon as you get back to the lodge, the guide posts and said, oh, look, I saw this unique species, whatever yeah. your case is. To me, that's wrong. Yeah. Now, what I do from a social media point of view, when I get a private client, on safaris, mm-hmm. on groups, even in the vehicle, yeah. I will say to people, listen, guys, I am going to post on social. Are you okay to be in the videos or the yes. selfies or whatever the case is? And I then urge them to post yes. in the trip. Yes. And I, the, the, I make the case because if I, as the guide, can take you from taking the image, editing it, getting online, I'm giving you a full cradle to grave teaching episode. Mm. But for me to rush back and do it, I also think, and this is an interesting one, if you go and look at a lot of photographers' feeds, like, look at my feed. Okay, I haven't posted wildlife for a while. I'm doing something else. But go and look. The guys who post hero shot mm. after hero shot after hero shot after hero video after hero video, should we not question why they're doing what they're doing? Yeah. Exactly. I, like you say, I mean, if I can think, my best images I have never get, I, I've never been able to get them. Mm. Because it's always, you're always a step behind your client. Yeah. Or you're shooting afterwards. Yeah. Guys who post hero and they're so fucking amazing and all up themselves mm. and it's this amazing video and, 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 dude, is your attention where it should be? Yeah, exactly. I'd like to, for, like to find out from, from you guys now, what would you say, if you're on a safari, what is the time frame from, the, from your safari to the time that you think is fine for a guy to post images? Like, let's say you've got a amazing scene, right? A python eating a pangolin. Oh, right. that'd be cool. <laughs> and, and you get these amazing images. You both got the same photographs. You didn't get home. How long would you guys say would be a good time before a guide can then start posting? It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, on the the is, is it a is it a week? Is it a month? Are we talking days? Are we talking yeah. never? Are we talking a year? Yeah. I'm so, so while you guys, I mean, for the live people. So what I've done in the past is I remember with Nancy. If Nancy, if you watch this, hey, hope you're doing well. Uh, post your own photos of the trip before your client. So. And I would, and I got some images that I wanted to like post or publish or whatever the case yeah. is. I literally a year later, so I posted mm. some from the trip from a marketing point of view, but not hero shots. Yeah. Because I knew, and I should, because that's my job. What my what images my client got. Yes. And before I used some of those images, I mailed Nancy and I said to her, "Listen, I'm going to start using these. Are you okay with it? Yeah. Of course she's okay with it. It's it's a hobby for her. Yeah. But that." Just checking with your client because you should. There, you go, Brad. Um, ask your client what they feel comfortable with time-wise. 100%. But guys come home and they want to stroke their own egos and just post this stuff immediately, yeah. which is wrong. So ethically, when we're talking about client and guide interaction, that's another thing. <clears throat> Some people Absolutely. take money, which they shouldn't. Some people abuse the client privilege, Absolutely. which they shouldn't. And that's yeah. not right. Yeah. Not right. I've got quite a few questions coming through, which is really cool to see. Um, so I'm a, for Gas Level One looking for a good wildlife photography course. Who could I possibly contact? Send Johan an email. He's a rock star, and we can help you with that. <laughs> so Estian Cruz. So guys, we've actually got a we just launched a mm-hmm. online wildlife photography course, uh, or like a digital photography course, but pretty much the same thing. Yeah. And then if you have any questions after that, we can do one-on-one tuitions with you. So send me a DM. Easy. And uh, I'll send you a link and make it happen. Yeah. Quickly, while we're on ethics, so Judy asks, so is it ethical for a guy to claim a sighting that they didn't really discover in the first place? I did it all the time. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, those of you, so, yeah, you see now. So, what happens is you would go, you'll find a sighting, and then you would call on the radio. Mm. I used to, if I found it and I did a lot of hard graft for it, then I would stop, enjoy it for a little while on our own. Yes. And if the animal was going to now bugger off into the bush, then 
leave it because yeah. you don't want people to bash through looking for this thing. If it's a static sighting, absolutely call people in. Yeah. But I think it's just if a guy has to claim a sighting they didn't like if he goes back this afternoon and he makes like he's tracking it's like oh my god yeah. look I found the line no. that's just insecure you're an idiot yeah so no, it's, uh, it's not ethical it's just silly yeah no I, I mean look it's, it's not going to be the end of the world but it's just it's not, <laughs> not um, it's not great not great you're not, you're not going to sort of there are a lot worse things to do let's be I, I think what's going to happen if you do this and it's and your, your clients probably don't care yeah but you're going to find that you, you're guiding with other people. The other yeah. guys are not saying, listen, Jerry's being a bit of a dick. Let's not share with him. So, yeah, you need yeah. to play nice. Yeah, mm. 100%. Um, can you show my animal spotting tricks? Okay, that's something different. And then a question that's here a couple of times we've had in the past as well is people posting images of caged or tame or, or, or how do we say this? Wildlife. That is not really wildlife, mm. but selling it as. Mm -hmm. There was this big thing, Animals of Montana, yeah. where they had this ranch. And one of my clients told me about a Dennis, and then it's been in the news recently for different reasons as well, that you have this big ranch and there's different areas to it. There's like a rocky area, a little forest area, and this and that. And then they've got all these kind of tame, habituated animals. Mm. I could then go and say, okay, cool, listen, I would like that snow leopard on that rock. Or I would like this giraffe in the snow, or whatever it yes. might be. People would do that and they would claim it as wildlife. It is not wildlife yeah. photography. But because someone has a massive following of 500,000, mm. people are like, oh my God, that's just incredible. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's where nothing wrong with it, but you know, just be honest in what you're doing. You know, if you're photographing animals in a zoo because you know, you're in lockdown, you can't get to Africa, <laughs> whatever. Then Check what Mike says. What's the combination, G? 5183, Mike. We just came back from an episode. That's yeah, very different. Don't even go there. It's too soon, man. <laughs> yeah, too soon. Um, you know, yeah, just be honest on what, you, what you're photographing. You know, if you're photographing in zoos and things, you know, just say. I mean, you can still create beautiful images if you go to Monte Cassino Bird Garden, but then don't, don't portray it to be as something that it's not. The thing is, I mean, so if you look at the um, Kevin Richards and the Lion Whisperer, mm. he has a, was it, what would you call it, a farm? Or like a yeah. city? Massive place we've got some lions on. Now... Whether the worker does, he does is good or not, I think he's, he's I don't have a problem with him. I wouldn't want to go necessarily and photograph there, mm. but then people go there, they photograph it, and they, they, they don't, they, they share these insane images of a lion yeah. jumping over a puddle. Obviously, you laying down and you get the shot up at this lion. They post that as wildlife photography, and then people come to us and they say, hey, I want to get something like that. Yeah. But it's not real we need to be honest about this thing and that's where the ethics falls apart yeah and the problem is there's very big names in the industry well that think they're in the industry who do this yeah. and people look up to them and because they have a big following they have to be right yeah they're not right the number of followers you have does not make you right or wrong what no. you do makes you right or wrong 100%. And then these big photographers with a massive followings, people would go and support them because, oh no, he's a great wildlife photographer because you're trying to curry favor. Yeah. Come on. And, and because he's got that big following and because he's got amazing photographs, he has to be uh, doing something right. <clears throat> Question Where's the line with habituation, your opinion? Photographing wild cheetahs on foot. We were speaking about this, John mentioned this just before we started. What do you think? Look, I. You know, again, I think it, it comes down to the to the communication thereof. You know, if cheetahs can be habituated quite well on foot, mm. and you know, it's there's but are they wild then? They're not wild, so but it, I mean, it can't be it can't Continue. be marketed as that. You, I do feel that there's, and I might be like digging off myself here, but <laughs> I do feel you know, in order for Let's take smaller <coughs> reserves, for example, right? In order for them to compete with some of the big names that's out there, with the Sabi Sands, the Krugers, the Mala Mala, 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 Mala all these places, they, there's got to be something out there that that stands out a little bit. And you know, whether I'm, I'll support it or not is, is, a, is a total different story. But I think if you, if you open with the fact that you say, you know, these cheetahs we got in, they are wild, they still hunt. We don't feed them; they still hunt for themselves, but they have become habituated to people on foot. Very similar to monopoles in a way, with yeah. like the wild dogs, um, lions, maybe to a degree, the elephants have become a little bit more used to people on foot. Same thing with cheetahs. Cheetahs are also not going to be a threat for you, right? So they don't 
they're not designed to hunt primates and they're not going to attack you unless you've got a piece of steak um, that you've got in your pants I, or whatever. I hate it when that happens. But, oh. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't necessarily have a big problem with that, yet it still has to be ethical. You know, if you go, if the cheetah moves, if you yeah. get like within a meter from it, if the cheetah moves and it wants to walk away from you, if you then walk in front of it and block it off and just to photograph it, and it tries to change direction again, you block it off again. Yeah. You know, that's again where it starts getting um, a little <laughs> bit, a little bit edgy. But the, the, the concept, I don't, yeah. I, I don't particularly have I think a that's also how it's marketed. If someone says, come and look at our wild cheetahs, we'll get you close on foot. They'd rather say to me, come for a cheetah experience. Yes. Because then he's saying to me, you are going to walk with this thing. Yeah. Alternative, and just a quick story. So I was up in the Thule block many, many years ago, Photo Africa days. Brad's giving me a hard time and Penny, I agree, don't interact with animals. <laughs> and I'm glad you like elephants. <laughs> um, we were in the Thule block and we were tracking lions. Now, this is a block where there's very, very little um, human traffic or, or guiding or lodges or anything. We were up on this hill and we saw a male lion way down. I'm talking like two, 300 meters. We were on a hill down. This thing stopped, look up at us at 300 meters, and he just ran. Right, yeah. So we went down, we tried to find his tracks, and this thing just went. Yeah. So the guests I had with me, it was friends and family, but they were like, oh my God, they saw a real wild lion. So now the question you have to ask yourself mm. is, do you want to have a tame, I use those in inverted commas, a tame cheetah experience, mm. or go to an area where there are real wild cheetahs that have not been habituated, and go on foot, you might be 200 meters from it, but you'll be on foot with a real wild animal, mm. or do you want to be with a more habituated animal? Mm. There's, like, I don't have a problem with it, but we need to start, 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 like you say, telling the real story. Yeah. Those are not wild animals. Yeah. They have been habituated. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a black and white. This is a gray area. Yeah. At what point, that habituated cheetah could, just, could still lose a sense of humor and scratch you. Yeah. Or bite your steak or whatever. But... It's how it gets presented. Yes. A cheetah experience in the Mara, if you have, like, let's say we're drinking, hypothetically, we are drinking, we're having our morning breakfast, mm. and a cheetah walks 100 meters past us. They do. Yeah. And they kind of look at you and they walk past. That's one experience. Yeah. Where I think people will enjoy that more because it's real and legit. Yes. Then saying, we're going to drive up to this cheetah, okay, just be quiet. Now you can lay down on the floor because she won't run away. Mm. Mm. It depends yeah. on what you want. Yeah. Get a bigger lens. But it, it also, I think it also, a part of it is, you know, where people can get access to. And <coughs> not everyone can probably afford a safari to the Mara yeah. or, or to the Serengeti. So there is that part of it. But I think, you know, nothing beats the, the wild experience. That there's, mm. there's a certain charm. And I think we had it, or um, we said it when we were at, was it at Seseka? Yes, yeah, Seseka, when there was the lioness that had brand new cubs yeah and she was in this thicket and we, we couldn't find them we couldn't find the cubs yeah there's a certain charm to that that you know if she can hide or if she wants to hide she can mm. you know you don't want to force a vehicle through there just purely for the sake of mm -mm. getting a sighting there's that charm that that lioness is obviously in the thicket because she doesn't want to be seen um which i much prefer to you know just having it on your doorstep and yeah you, you can you can drive to that water hole and you know the cheetah's going to be then you can walk them or um, run with them or whatever there's so, a lot to be said for the uncertainty of safari yeah like going out in the morning that suspense of ooh, what are we going to see yeah. like shit, we heard them roar at five o'clock in the morning here's the tracks where are they yeah that is safari that's exactly. the experience of finding the thing exactly let's change track i've got a question for you johan yes dion asks what is your opinion on tiger canyon and go Dion who? Um, let's see here. Dion Wildlife Photography. Okay. Um, Dion, so it took me a while to to understand the, the, the story of it. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, it, it, it's about how you how you tell the story and how you believe it. Um, so at the moment, I don't know if, you've, if you guys have been to Tiger Canyon, it, it's made out of um, different sections. So I think I might be mistaken. You've got about four or five different sections and in that section there might be X amount of tigers in there. So that is one of the things, to be totally honest, one of the things that did put me off a little bit is that you know you are going through gates and things to go to different tigers. But their story is that you know tigers have been you know, part of the reason that they that the numbers are so low is because of humans, right? So 
they they basically want to use this reserve as bring the tiger population back up again my biggest thing is you know where are these tigers going if they're breeding are they going back to india then it's great you know if we can get the gene pool up and you know get have they um there, there are some of them that are breeding but have they sent back not yet no so uh, as far as i know look I, i'm not too informed of what's happening on the, the the inside scoops but that, that is the plan. I think the biggest challenge that they're facing now, and most of South Africa, is to get enough land. The re reserve, I think, in total, oh, speaking under, cor under correction, I think it's about five or 6,000 hectares. Mm. It's a beautiful, beautiful reserve. I think, I think that there's massive potential for it to work. Mm -hmm. And I know the purists will say, you know, tigers don't belong in Africa. And, but, you know, again, it's that, that conservation story. If we can get it right, if they can breed and they breed naturally, if they hunt naturally, and we can then get the numbers up and you know send some um, some new genes to India, I really think it could work. I think. Can, can I can I ask you a question? Yes. So I haven't been there. Um, I have my <coughs> excuse me, COVID. No, it's not. I'm joking. Um, oh. So I haven't been there. And I have my opinion on it, but but until I've been there, I can't really comment. John, I want to come a beer. We're almost finished. So, why, when you were there, did you not post that experience on social? Because I, I wanted to, to get a better idea and understanding of it. And let, let me put it this way. Will it be a place where I'd market to all my clients, come, you have to come and experience this with me? Probably not. Will it be a place that I will go to with guests that say, listen, I can't, I can't afford going to India or I really don't want to go there? Yes, I will. Is the experience better than in India? I don't think so. I hope, I hope that answers it. I think it's, it, 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 it's worth going to check out. You know, either one of two things has to happen. My opinion, again, this is with no disrespect at all. Um, either those tigers have to, have to breed naturally and you then supply that demand in, in India mm. to get the numbers up. Or you have to say, no breeding, all of them get... Uh, not sterilized, what do you call it? I don't know, I'm neutering my boys next week, so that's what <coughs> I'm mind, yeah. Um, get snipped, whatever. So yeah. they, they, they can't breed. Allow them to live mm. out the rest of their life and then, you know, draw the line from there. No more tigers to come in. What, that, if, that what if we created, sorry, what if we created Bear Canyon? Grizzly Bear Canyon. We'll survive. You fly in snow and like... But this is the thing. I mean, yeah. at, at what so... Does the area, so it's in the free state, hey? Yes. So does that mimic close enough to what they do? I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm just a little bit of a devil's advocate here for this. So I'm, I'm not a fan of the idea, but I get what they're trying to do. Mm. So do I, would I support them and throw money at them? No, not yet, because I'm not sure they're going to execute from cradle to grave that, 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 that they promise they will. Yeah. But like, if you say they are getting there, then that's cool. I mean, give them maybe benefit of the doubt and see what happens. Yeah. But where do we draw the line? I mean, what if, what if why don't we bring Indian elephants? or bears, mm. or I don't know what other big species are out there, lemurs, yeah. let's bring lemurs and create Lima Island in South yeah. Africa. I mean, or what if we take, um, I don't know, pick another species from here and go put them over there. Yeah. I think it bothers us because deep down we are programmed on how things should work. I go to Great Bear Rainforest to see a bear, I go to Swabot to see a polar bear, I go to India to see a tiger. So, at core level, it bothers us mm. when I'm like, there's a tiger in India, this thing shouldn't be here. Yeah. Whether you think it's good or not, deep down it's like, mm, yeah. what? But maybe we should get the benefit of the doubt. I don't know. I haven't been. You can speak to that. Yeah. But I would like to see, how long have we been going? So Tiger Canyon, so I, I mean, John Varty started it, oh, I'm speaking under correction now. I think it's been going like 15 years. Holy shit, that long. Yeah. But in 15 years, they must have given a tiger back to India. Or so, not. so not yet. Um, mm, see, that, that bothers me. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think there, there's obvious logistical issues yeah. uh, with, with flats and things. But, you know... Let, the, me, let me ask you this. Yeah. And I don't know if you know the answer to this. Tiger Canyon. Okay, cool. Now, they want to save the tigers and ship them back to wherever they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's all great because they've got tourists coming in. Yeah. How much money are they making off it themselves? Yeah, so... Is it all going to concert? Is it all for here? Here's the tiger. Boom. Or am I buying myself a new Panerai watch and a fucking Sony camera with this money? No, so it's 
and as you know, you know the 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 smaller the the reserves are, the parks are, the more intense the management has to be. Yeah. So they've got to buy in game to sustain those tigers. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Look, I I think there there is a conservation story there. It if anything, you know, if l- let's say they don't take the tigers to mm. um, to India, if the, the main story they can tell is the the threat that these tigers are under mm. by giving South African people the opportunity to visit this particular park. Look, th- those tigers are not going to be able to go back to India anyway. No. So we might as well make the most of them. So then, the, then the argument should be we're creating awareness. Yes. We're creating awareness for an international species. Maybe that's a better narrative. So that that's again, you know, that's look. I was only there for for three nights. I, I would love to sort of stay there longer. I had a I had a dinner with with the owners, and, and you know, they're extremely passionate about the the whole project. Mm. But I do think you know the the story that has to get told yeah. has to be the right one because you, you you can. You can quite easily go in there and say, "Listen, I think this is a total cock up. Mm. This shouldn't happen." But you can also, you know, look at it from the point of view that my thing was, and I'll say it again: I won't take guests there. I'd much rather take guests to India because mm. I think it's the overall experience for me is better. But you know, if there's um, Susie, Tom, and Kevin who's now living in Johannesburg and they can't go to India. Mm. And they really want to see tigers before they die, you know. Then it's an opportunity to go and, and, and see a tiger is, that's still in the wild. Sure. So, so I mean, there's a question here. The narrative won't change the fact that it's a wrong animal in the wrong place. Hundred percent agreed. So then, I think if if Susie and John and their friends, whatever the name was, if they're going to go and look at the tigers in the wild, they need to be. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, they need to then think that you know what. I am going to look at this tiger in the wild, even though it's just a big ass cage. Mm. So, are you okay to watch it in the zoo? If you say no, but you're willing to go look at the tigers in the place, does that just mean you don't like the size of the cage? Yeah. Or are you against the principle? Mm. We can keep this can keep going forever. But then again, you know, there, there's there's more tigers in captivity in the United States than there are in the wild. Tigers. So, what was that? You know, tigers also don't belong in the states. No, yeah, that's true. So, Doesn't like Texas have most of them? Yeah. So you know, it's it's all about it's all about narrative. Yes, in the perfect world, they should all be in the same thing with lions. You know, you can go. I mean, we can talk about this for hours and and debate it, and it often gets heated because there, there, there's so many different opinions on this. But in the ideal world, yes, everything should stay in the wild. Can we create awareness by bringing the animals into areas where they could live a better life than what what they would have had? Even if it's not where they belong, I think yeah. I think there is a there is a room for that. I'm not promoting. I'm not saying every single person take off your lions and put tigers on there, <laughs> but they've really got tigers on there. So let's try and make the most Let, of that. Let, let's yeah. let's try and promote the conservation of these animals mm. instead of just saying like I'm not going to support any of that. And what about taking that? What about has anybody asked the tiger what he thinks? Do you think that tiger? How many? Did you see a tiger there? Yeah. Do you think uh, that yeah, tiger in his cage? He's th- sitting there thinking, "Fuck, I wish I was in India." No. Nah, nah. So maybe then, and look, we're fighting both sides here. Yeah. We're trying to argue this from both sides. But maybe that tiger is so fucking happy that he hasn't got fifteen jeeps trying to chase him because he's in zone two and he's not in zone five and whatever the case is in India. And maybe he's just cool. So if we can argue awareness, so because for me, listening to this, and you'll know better, mm. but listening to the miss to this yes. mm-hmm. <laughs> mouth is tight um, listening to this I'm still not convinced at the conservation side thereof because if they in 15 years have not given anything back then they need to start questioning it if the argument is purely awareness and let's show John and Susie and stuff go and look at a tiger mm. support that make the tiger live out his happy life yeah. I don't know it, it, it's, there's, there's no right answer here yeah. I would but the tiger is still a bit raw about it Oh, Brad, you're funny. R O A R. And it's also, you know, I, I think you have to, you know, once you go to um, to India and these places, you actually realise just how endangered these animals are. You know how how critical their situation is. You know, they're, they're living in areas with um, massive populations of people. Mm. That that human animal conflict is a real thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like I said, I mean, I haven't spent 
spent years there. That's why I haven't been too too vocal about it. I'm still mm-hmm. partly sort of arguing with myself, you know, when I when I, when I when I think about it. Yeah. But I think it is, if anything, it is a place where you can yeah you can see that beautiful animal and, and maybe a, like raise some awareness. I think that's so. So the interesting beautiful. thing. So all the conservation starts with a great intention and then ends up being for being for a profit center. I, I was just thinking back now to like um, Borneo, for example. Yeah. If we had to create orangutan forest here with massive cages around it. 100% with G on that. Really? What? Really, really? says 100% with G on Sweet. That. And it also um, is, for example, let's, let's just, stupid example, Madagascar. Yeah. An I I. Yeah. Right. A hairy little Yoda. There's, there's literally, there's, there's literally like less than a hundred of these things in the world, in the world, and they all live in Madagascar, in certain areas. If you're high enough to start an II sanctuary mm-hmm. here in four ways, a fuck off big piece of land, mm-hmm. all the, the, the food they want, the plants they want and everything, and we, how many of you would not come and look at it? Would you stand by your ethics? And be so strong that I will not support Johan and Jerry's II Center because they don't belong here. Or would you take the chance to see one of less than 100 animals in the world? How many of you guys listening and watching and on the live would actually say, screw you, Oaks. It's not right that they're there. I don't want to come and see it. What if we said new II genetics to Madagascar? That'll make you think. Pregnant pause. That'll make you think. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's look... Personally, if you had to say to me, do I like Taki Canyon or not? I would say no, yeah. but but with the, the subtext of I don't know the full story. Yeah. Um, I would like, I know what I would like to see from it mm. and from my eye center. Watch this place. <laughs> but, um, Opening soon. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, we, we both agree on the fact that we will much rather choose um, the, the wild most natural experience yeah an experience yeah above smaller tamer better photographic mm. so yeah you, you, you can have a small reserve you can get some kick ass cheetah photos and things I would still I know you would be the same still go for a wild place where the photographic opportunities are not as great but the experience is wilder yeah and more free. Sorry, a couple of things. Brad says he's going to go have his beauty sleep. Good luck with that. Good night. Um, <laughs> good night. Um, and then MV Photography and Judy says they won't come. Sorry. Now, what I would like is that the more people say that, I think the shift would happen if this happens at scale to us doing it for the right reason. So, yeah. good on you guys. Yeah. I must be honest, if there was an II center here, I'd be hard pushed not to go and have a look, but not for photography. So, here's the thing. Is... And the people that that go into these small reserves, right? Go into these small reserves and get these kick-ass shots. To me, and maybe this is kind of a a segue into us kind of closing all this up. Wildlife photography should be more about wildlife than it is about photography. If you are doing wildlife photography for the photography only, you are wrong. Missing a whole it lot. should be wildlife photography should be more about the wildlife than it should be about the photography and many people fuck that up Straight. Straight. that's why they would go to places to photograph it I was at a in, in Borneo we went to an orangutan sanctuary or a primate sanctuary thing it was a dog show mm. so yes then they feed these things and I did see them in the wild and the experience was much better it, must, it was much better seeing an orangutan in the wild. I could see just about half his ass cheek because he's in the, in the, in the <laughs> orange hairy thing. But uh. he was deep, deep, deep inside the forest. But that experience for me and my guests was way better. I didn't take a single image in the sanctuary because it was a mess. People yeah. everywhere, it, it was not right. So wildlife photography should be more about wildlife than it is about photography. If any of you listening, watching on the live stream or on the video and audio don't agree, sorry, we can't be friends. Yeah. <laughs> then leave now. Yeah, and I think a, a few people said there, and I think that this this sums up um, what we've been saying is just be honest. Yeah. Be, be honest about your product. If you're a, from a um, a lodge, you know, if you're a smaller reserve, if you've got tame cheetahs, you know, be honest with that. Mm. Say it's a cheetah experience. I think if you're a photographic guide, be honest. Yeah. You know, say that your images come first. <clears throat> if you feel that you 
are so famous and so good that it's a privilege for people just to be in your presence, then say that. You know, you're going to pay purely just to be in my presence and I'm still going to be taking photographs. Be people honest would about pay it. a lot of money for people, that. People would for your, pay. For your presence. Only if you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I think that's where the, the honesty comes in. Mm. And yeah, what else do I want to say? I think that's pretty much Honestly, it. Honesty is the big thing. I remember just a little thing at the end. I was speaking to one of my clients before I was heading to the Iceland for the first time and they were photographing with an Italian wildlife photographer. Oh, no, sorry, landscape photographer. Yeah. And so Dennis, my client, he's used to us kind of doing anything. So they walk out and then there's the main photographer, that this, let's call him Luigi. <laughs> <laughs> is that stereotyping? <laughs> sorry. So Luigi's there, he's this hero photographer. Hmm. There's the six clients lined up all with their tripods and then there's the assistant. Yeah. So Luigi would walk, he starts walking at this glacier or whatever, and Dennis goes and he starts walking and the assistant says, no, 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 you've got to wait. And Dennis is like, okay, maybe there's like a safety thing or whatever. So Luigi sets up and he starts shooting. And Dennis wants to walk. And the other clients who's been with this guy waits back and the guy says, no, 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 you have to wait. And Dennis is like, what the fuck? As Luigi finishes there, he walks to the next spot. It's almost like they open the gates and all these people run to where uh-huh. Luigi was. And they try and get the same shots because yeah, of where, he's not and he's shooting over there. So people paid just to kind of be with him, and they learned jack shit on there. Hmm. Yeah, don't get it. Mario was the assistant. Luigi and Mario. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So words of advice or encouragement to someone starting out with wanting to improve the wildlife photography? Easy. Go listen to our podcast. Go and follow our blogs, and go and check out our YouTube videos. It is amazing. Let's see if there's any last okay. questions. Yet. We have, let's call it one minute. Anybody have questions, we'll answer them. Otherwise, we're going to start calling this. New school versus old school ethics. A lot has changed. Really, oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Uh, let's see what other questions are here. Transparency is important. I love when photographers tell their stories of the <laughs> picture in the caption. It helps appreciate it. Hmm. Helps appreciate it its true value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Can you just scroll here? Good night, but everybody said good night to Brad. That's kind of sweet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think let's That's it. let's put a ribbon on this. So this went all over the show, and so for those of you watching this, right? So if you're watching this on YouTube or Instagram TV or you're listening to the podcast, this is the Q and A number sixty. Two. two. Yeah. It started as Q and A, and I think it became something else. This is number sixty-two. Yeah. Next week we will go back. And I think we should do more of this. We choose a topic, we start talking, and we take it live. Yeah. There's something here. So if you have any questions for us, um, let us know, and we'll include it next week. Otherwise, guys, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us on the live. And um, we'll see you in the next episode. We'll put our emails at the bottom of the video. Otherwise, just find us on Instagram. I'm sure it won't be that difficult. Mm-hmm. Not even going to share it. Yeah. Okay. Guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My name is Jerry. My name is Johan. We're from Wild Eye. Stay ethical. Bye. Bye.